In 1969, a pivotal change happened in the United States. California implemented a law that soon swept the nation, a law making divorce much easier. Over the next decade, divorce rates in America doubled, and they keep climbing. Did those politicians know what impact that law would have on American families, on children? Did they think about the pain that it would cause? Did they think about how that pain could lead to a person's worst nightmare? Eh, probably not, but there is hope to be found in the midst of all that suffering. Let's dive in. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Woohoo! Yes, and that includes sound effects. Just a heads up, this episode contains content that may not be appropriate for our younger listeners. I'm Timothy Gregory, and today we follow the story of a woman and her son and the tragedy that comes when a person will go to any lengths to numb their pain in this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you'll want to stick around because later we are going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for an exciting prize. But first, let's get to it, folks. Part one in the true story of Dory Greeson. bedroom. Oh, there you are, all packed and ready to go. You excited about spending time with your dad? Yes. You mind whatever he asks you to do and always show him respect. You know he loves you. I know. How are you feeling about all this back and forth? Okay. I know it's hard on you and your brother. Mondays and Thursdays with me, Tuesdays and Wednesdays with dad. I don't mind. It's important for boys to be with their dad. Can I ask you a question? You can ask me anything. You know that. Does God like divorce? No. No, he doesn't. Sometimes he allows it, but no. He doesn't like it. Your dad wanted his girlfriend instead of me, so we just do the best we can. And God's given you a great stepdad. Dad's here. You better get going. I love you, Robbie. It's estimated that one out of every three marriages in America today ends in divorce. And when there are children involved, the impact on their lives can have far-reaching consequences. But there is still hope, even when those consequences lead to a parent's worst nightmare. We now bring you part one in the true testimony of Dory Greeson and her family, right now on Unshackled. I realize now that no one loved me as much as my mom, Dory, did. I was only three when my parents got divorced. My older brother seemed to handle it a bit better than I did. As young kids, our life consisted of two worlds, mom's house and dad's house. In dad's home, there were fewer rules, but he always made sure we did our homework. In mom's home, there were more rules. But lots of game nights and trips to the beach. We went to church every week, and Mom helped me memorize a hundred Bible verses. I learned every one of them, not realizing how important they would be one day. Okay, Robbie, your turn. I'm not sure I know this one. Sure you do. Just take your time. Galatians? Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for, for whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. Good job. I'm not sure what it means. If you sow good choices, you'll be blessed. And if you sow bad choices, your life will probably be a mess. God gives us rules to follow, and those rules are for our protection. Some people make fun of his rules, and when they disobey him, they end up paying the consequences. Like the guys that you and Jean help in prisons? Yep. Many of them sowed bad choices, and now they're reaping the consequences. So they're bad people, right? Actually, all of us are bad. 
we're all sinners who need God to forgive us so we can become the people he wants us to be. And that's what you tell the prisoners? Exactly. Many struggle to believe that God loves them no matter what mistakes they've made in life. And we teach them how to start making good choices with God's help. Got it? Yeah, I think so. Good job tonight. I'm so proud of you. Whenever I stayed at Mom's house, she read the Bible to me every day. One night, she read about the rapture, where God takes everyone who believes in him up into the air. I told her I didn't want to be left behind. It was then that I put my trust in Jesus as my Savior and thanked him for eternal life. I always believed I was saved that night, but there were times I wasn't so sure. How was soccer practice? Terrible. Coach made us run extra laps. I'm so hungry. You made brownies? They're for after dinner. Quiz me on a Bible verse, and if I get it right, I get dessert now. <laughs> you are one determined teenager. Okay. Psalm 119, verse 11. That's an easy one. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. <laughs> well done. Take a small one. Thanks. You were extra quiet this morning. Mm, something on your mind? Did you ever doubt you were a Christian? Which time? What do you mean? Well, the little church I grew up in had a walk the aisle invitation every Sunday. I'd go forward thinking, maybe this time I'm truly getting saved. And on Monday, when I would do something wrong, I was convinced it meant I wasn't saved yet. So I'd walk the aisle the next Sunday. How old were you? Nine. Years later, my brother invited me to a Bible study, and the leader showed us a verse in Ephesians. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right then I realized that everlasting life is a gift, and not something I could ever earn. I knew then it could never be taken away from me. Robbie, do you believe that? Yeah? No matter what happens in your life, always remember God's promise of eternal life to those who trust in him. Once you are his child, you will always be his child, even when you stumble and fall. Even when you stumble and fall. I was already falling, but she didn't know it. My dad kept some liquor in his house. Sometimes... When he wasn't home, I'd take a swig of the vodka bottle that he kept in the fridge. First time was just to see what it was like, but after a while I started pouring some into an empty water bottle to take to school. When I was 16, a group of us formed a garage band at my dad's house. We were convinced that we were the next Nirvana as we screamed out the lyrics and threw our fists in the air. This created some tension between my mom and me since she didn't think my being in a punk band was helping my anger issues. So, I decided to live full-time at my dad's house. Life was great, until I got the idea to run away for a week. The police eventually found me sleeping in someone's driveway and took me to their station. They called Mom. She and Jean drove me to my dad's house. Dad informed me that I could no longer be in the band, so I moved to Mom's house. Mom knew I needed a break from peer pressure, so she decided to homeschool me for my last years of high school. Crazy part, even though she and Jean loved me, I still wanted to run away. Nice and quiet, Robbie, and they'll never know. Never know what? Mom! You scared me half to death. I thought you two were in bed. We were. God told me you were about to run away, so I told your mother we should check on you. What are you doing, Robbie? I was just opening my window to get some fresh air. Is that why you tossed your shoes and backpack out the window? You saw that? Yep. Listen, I just want to be on my own. I'm ready to see the world like Ben did and be with my friends. Your brother waited until he was 18. You're not emancipated yet. Unless you have a way to get your GED, pay for insurance, and rent a decent apartment. 
You need to stay here. I just want to have my own life. Well, one day you will. But you need to finish school first. Let's get the stuff you dropped outside. Then we'll all sit down and talk this through. I realize now how special that final year at home was. I was laser focused and completed two years of school in one year with mostly A's. On the day I turned 18, my brother came over to see me off. The four of us stood in a circle while mom and Jane prayed over me, asking God to protect me on this adventure I was so desperate to start. We hugged goodbye and then my brother and I took off down the road. Although I called them at times, it would be four years before I would see Mom and Jean again. I hitched rides across the country, stopping in odd places and taking odd jobs to earn enough money for beer and food. Then I'd go restless and move on to another town. Some nights, I slept on a bench. Other nights, on a stranger's couch. By this time, I was drinking every day. The verses I memorized as a kid popped in my mind now and then, but... When they did, I just drowned them out with another beer. I eventually started hopping trains, which wasn't always safe. Every fall, I made my way to North Dakota for the sugar beet harvest, which lasted nearly a month. I never worked so hard in my life, but I enjoyed the friends I was making, especially a girl named Kate. As I worked the fields, I sang worship songs I remembered from growing up. At night, I'd fall into my bunk exhausted from the hard labor. As I laid there, I often thought about that Bible story I learned as a kid. You harvest what you plant, whether good or bad. You harvest what you plant. Hello? Mom? How are you? Robbie! Th that's me. I borrowed my friend's cell phone. Gene, it's Robbie. Where are you? What are you doing? Are you okay? I'm fine, Mom. I'm in Seattle. Oh, that's great. Uh, so, what are you doing? I'm getting ready to head to the beet harvest soon. You wouldn't believe all the places I've been to and all the people I've met. How's Gene? He's fine. He misses you, too. Robbie, what can we do for you? What do you need? Hey, Robbie, hurry up. We gotta get going. Uh, listen, I gotta go. Uh, give Gene a big hug for me. We love you, Robbie. We can help you. All you need to do is ask. And Mom, I love you. You're the best person I know. I'll call you again. I promise. God, please watch over him. Folks, we'll get back to Dory's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 73rd year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we are able to share Unshackled worldwide so, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there is one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check to Unshackled and mail it to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, back to the true story of Dory Greeson. I kept traveling, moving from one group of friends to the next. I was always the life of the party until I drank too much and became the clown of the party. No one knew just how sad I was. One time, I passed out and someone tattooed my face as a joke. When I came to and looked in the mirror, I laughed along with them, too embarrassed to let them know how I really felt. But somehow, I always felt God watching over me. One time, a complete stranger prayed for my friends and me and handed us a hundred bucks so we could spend the night in a hotel and get showers. One night, 
I drank way too much and passed out in a field. When I woke up, the hospital I needed was directly across the road. I shared these escapades with my mom, and she would always tell me that God's love and grace was sustaining. Still, my great adventure had turned into an alcohol addiction that I could no longer control. More than once, the police picked me up off the streets and put me in jail. My friends would pool some cash together, bail me out, and then I'd go right back to drinking. My addiction was a vicious cycle, and I had become blind to how bad things really were. Um, uh, Robbie? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, I'm Dr. Phillips. The addiction specialist assigned to your case. I don't know what happened. I, I never blacked out like that before. Well, I'm surprised you're alive. When you were admitted to the ER, your blood alcohol was 0.28. Much more, and you'd either be dead or in a coma. Tell me, how many drinks do you typically have? Eight or ten beers. A week? Every night. Oh. Robbie, uh... I'd like to enroll you in an alcohol recovery program. They'll help you deal with your addiction and... No! I, 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 I don't want to do that. If you don't get help, there's a good chance that your drinking will eventually kill you. You need to surround yourself with a good support team who will... You can't keep me here. I can leave whenever I want, right? <sighs> you are correct. Just uh, sign this paper, and you're free to go. Do you have someone you can call to come pick you up? Yeah. There's this girl I know. You left the party without telling anyone. No one knew where you were. I was so worried about you. What happened? Now all I remember is waking up in the hospital. So what did the doctors say? Nothing important. I've never seen you drink that much. Fine, Kate. Just get a little depressed every now and then. I miss the old Robbie. Smiling and laughing and singing about God and- God and I are not on the best of terms these days. That doesn't sound like you. You're always helping people or telling them to call your mom for advice or prayer. Yeah, she and Jean always know what to say. Have you called them lately? Nah, they don't need my problems. I don't want them worrying. Maybe you need to settle down somewhere. Maybe get married one day? That didn't work out too well for my parents. Okay. How about a change of scenery? I found a job I like in Wisconsin. We'll rent a two-bedroom apartment. I'll help you find work and- And remind me not to drink so much? Let me help you. It's been years since either one of us have had a home. Maybe it's time we both stopped running. I helped her move to Milwaukee and I found a job nearby. With Kate around, I managed to control my drinking just long enough to get my head clear. It was around Thanksgiving, and I finally had my own place. So I invited Mom and Jean to come visit. They booked a flight right away. Mom was so happy to see me that she couldn't stop hugging me. There was no escaping the concern in her eyes. Robbie, I've never seen you look so unhappy. I'm fine, Mom. Jean... You should have been with me on my last train ride. The mountains were awesome to look at. Did you meet any nice people on the train? I had the boxcar all to myself. Just rode it to wherever it stopped. Well, at least you're safe. Oh, I've missed you so much. I've missed you too. Robbie, we... We know something's not right. And whatever it is, we want to help you. We love you, Robbie. Hey, I know you do. There's no shame in trying rehab. It's helped a lot of people. I already tried different programs, and they didn't help. Well, that's okay. Some people need six months or even a year to stay sober and create healthy boundaries. I'll, I'll figure this out. I promise. I want you to be real honest with me about what you're struggling with. You can tell me anything. Do you believe Jesus can help you? I know my life is a mess, but... I still know Jesus is my savior. Okay. Even Christians can struggle with addiction while wanting to let Jesus be Lord of their life. Sometimes God even allows these things to draw us closer to him. Let us help you find the care you need. I'll be okay. 
I'm, I'm getting better. I really am. We got together a few more times before they flew home. When we hugged goodbye at the airport, I could tell my mom didn't want to let me go. She touched my face and told me she would always love me. As I watched them walk away, I brushed away the tears that clouded my eyes. I had no idea it would be the last time I ever saw them. I stayed sober for several weeks, and then the temptation grew to just have one beer. But once I had that beer, that same voice said, you already had one, might as well have another, and another. I avoided Kate for three days, but she guessed what was happening. She had seen that restless look in my eyes before, and knew it was only a matter of days before I would move on. I left her the phone we shared and headed back to Washington State where I bounced from house to house drinking more and more. My drinking was out of control, so I finally checked myself into a 30-day recovery program. The social worker did her best to help me. You're making progress, Robbie. If you say so. You seem down. What's going on? I'm not sure. Talk to me. Which one of the 12 steps are you struggling with? I know I'm powerless. I know my life is unmanageable. I know I need a power greater than myself. I even know what his name is. Okay. So, what's missing? I'm tired of fighting this. I'm tired of hearing these voices in my head. I, I just wish it was over. I get it. Addiction recovery is hard work. Tell me, are you still having thoughts of suicide? Sometimes. I, I think it's the only way to stop this pain I'm in. We think suicide stops the pain, but in reality, it only transfers it to our family and friends. Would you want that? No. I don't want to do that to my mom. Good. You talk about a god in our group sessions. What do you think he wants you to do? To trust him. To obey him. It's hard to do that when the temptations come. I think God made us to be in community, to lean on each other when we struggle. In your case, it means once you leave here, you commit to daily alcoholic support meetings. You'll move to Oxford House, a halfway home to help you stick with your recovery plan. That's a lot of work. I want you to understand how serious this is. You won't make it on your own. Breaking this addiction is more than just changing your behavior. It's about renewing your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Where's that from? It's a Bible verse that I learned as a kid. Those are good words to live by. The choice is yours, Robbie. Life or death. Which one do you choose? Someone once told me that addiction is like having two dogs that live inside you. One's named life, and the other's named death. And we get to decide which one we feed. I'll give you one guess which one I chose when my 30-day program was over. My friends picked me up and took me to their house. Soon I was drinking again, to the point they told me I had to leave. That night, I went to another friend's house to stay, but they wouldn't let me in because I was drunk. Somehow, I found my way to a party where I was about to make a new friend. Can you hand me one of those beers? Sure. Give me your empty one. Haven't seen you before. My name's Lindsay. What's yours? Robbie. You live around here? I'm used to. I'm headed out as soon as I find a ride. Where to? North Dakota. Do you live here? Nope. I head out tomorrow. Where to? Wherever my car takes me. <laughs> Want to ride along? So, what's your story? Where are you from? Grew up in Florida. Parents were divorced when I was young. Been bouncing around since I left home. You? The real story? Yeah. Left home at 15. 
started using meth and heroin. Had a baby at 17. My mom's raising him. Joined the National Guard for a while. Had a boyfriend who liked to rape and beat me. Broke my hand and nose a couple of times. One night he almost choked me to death. He ended up in prison. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry he did that to you. Yeah, me too. But my life didn't turn out like the Disney movies I watched as a little girl. My mom prays for people and helps them. You, sh you should meet her someday. <laughs> yeah, that'll never happen. I like drugs and beer too much. Good church people don't touch people like me. She loves everybody. She keeps reminding me that God still loves me. Hand me one of those. If there is a God, I doubt he cares about us. I mean, what's the point of living, anyway? You ever go to bed wishing you would never wake up and all the pain would be gone? I think that. Well, if you really wanted to do that, I could help you with it. You would do that for me? Hey, welcome to Starbucks. Can I have a name for the order? Sure, Dory. D-O-R-I. Um, I'll have a caramel macchiato. Got it. Just swipe your card. Next. Robbie, it's good to hear from you. How are you? It's Kate. Robbie left his phone with me. Oh. Um, hi, Kate. How are you? Is Robbie okay? Can I talk to him? Um, Robbie's, uh... Robbie's dead. Join us again next week when we'll hear the conclusion of this powerful story. Listening friend, most of the stories you hear on Unshackled end with great testimonies of God's deliverance. But there are times when even believers in Christ make choices that lead to tragic endings. In part two, you'll hear how God turned this tragedy into something far greater than anyone imagined. If you are dealing with tragedy, or if you are struggling with addiction, depression, or the guilt of your sins, we urge you to run towards God, not away from Him. If you need help in this critical decision, call 1-888-NEED-HIM, or you can get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions, and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org, or you can leave us a message at 312-281-1264. Now, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast. It really helps us out. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the prize for the sweepstakes contest is yet another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and 6, which reads, The day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. This plaque is beautiful, folks, and it would make a great everyday reminder of God's perfect promises. Unfortunately, we are only able to mail this plaque to locations within the United States, so our drawing is limited to U.S. addresses. But if you reside in the U.S., all you have to do to enter our sweepstakes drawing is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. That's your name, your phone number, and email. The deadline to enter the drawing will be December 2nd, and we will announce the winner on December 18th, just in time to be a great Christmas gift. We look forward to hearing from you. And next time...
This makes no sense. It says she only knew Robbie less than a month. Why would she do that to him? I don't know. Robbie had a kind soul. Why would anyone want to kill him? Dory Greason struggled to forgive the woman who killed her son. How hard was your life to lead you to do something like this? What were you thinking when you took my son's life? But reluctantly sends her a letter that will transform both their lives. To Lindsay, I want you to know that I have forgiven you. Don't miss this remarkable story of how God used her tragic loss to show the power of his forgiveness. I don't deserve this. Yes, you do. Forgiving one another, that's what Robbie would want us to do. It's part two in this true testimony of Dory Greason on the next Unshackled. Heard in part one of the true story of Dory Greason were Michael Wolner, Anna Maria Alvarez, Tom McElroy, Tina Glushenko, and Amanda Markeski. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Jacob Wilcoxon. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Scott Kirk. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ.